March 2nd. Oh, I'm sorry, Darius. Sorry. Now you can. Just takes 30 right. seconds for that thing to start. Sorry. Yeah, it's March 2nd, uh, 2021, 6 o'clock. First thing is uh, we're going to review the minutes from February 9th and a special meeting from February 5th. And Judy has who was here, who wasn't here, but I need a motion. Move to accept both sets. Second. Okay, so for the first, Phil's not on yet, is he? Nope. No. Okay, so the first for the first set, Phil and um, Ashley can't vote, so I'll just do the roll call. Bob. Yes. Uh, Lynn. Yes. Olivia. I'm sure, she's saying yes. Where'd she go? Oh, she just That's left. <laughs> okay. Uh, Judy. Yes. Mary. Yes. Damien. Yes. Ashley's not here. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. And who's the last one? Bill? Yes. Olivia's back. Olivia's back. <laughs> Olivia? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Now we're going to do it the same way again. Just raise your hand because everybody that's here for the February 5th minutes, if you vote to approve them, just raise your hand. Good. Good job. Okay. Thanks, Bob. Thank you. Um, I'm hoping everybody read their email. Uh, I think it was either yesterday or today from Darius that Shelly lost her mom. Uh, courageous yeah. battle. I think it was with cancer. And um, just want to let everybody know she's not here tonight. And um, we'll have a little bit to talk about with the financials. Correct, Darius? So there's no, um, there's no financial update. Um, she was also busy over the weekend and stuff. She was um, probably, I think she had more time and such, but um, so I don't have any of the financial statements there. And then even when we talk about the budget, it'll be limited in scope, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. Okay. Um, public comment. Um, we're going to start with Olivia had, um, had somebody hand something to her to read during our public comment. So you're on Olivia. Okay, yeah, let me just pull it up on my computer. Um, so this is from Erin Bodet, um, and she said, I'm not able to attend the meeting. I do hope the committee will consider supporting this statewide initiative for the following reasons. And she's referring to the statewide initiative to not have MCAS um, at the school this year. Um, first, that it's a waste of time and resources better spent on educating students in a year where they have lost so much already, that it adds to students, adds stress to students who are already stressed taking a test that they are not prepared for in order to graduate. The results will be invalid as it is normed to students who did not have this substantial disruption in their educations that the professionals in our school district are better able to assess our students than the MCAS exam in any year, but especially this one. I appreciate the school committee taking the time to consider this. Thank you for your service to the community, Erin Baudet. Thank you, Olivia. Sure. Is there any, we have no one that sent an email in this afternoon. Was there anybody else that's on that has public comment at all? Okay. And if we don't, uh, Livy, is your daughter handy? Hello. Where are you? Right here. Oh, okay. What, okay. You, what do you have for us? Student Council, um, we've been formulating the idea of maybe a wellness week. We don't really know what that would look like or what that would entail, but we've heard about other schools doing it and college doing it. Um, and we've seen some success with that. Um, so we've been toying around with that idea. I've been talking with our president, Isabel, just sort of trying to see what the best course of action, like obviously not taking a whole week off, like no classes or anything, because we have April break, we have uh, February break, but maybe 
um, like relax coursework if that's possible, maybe not for AP classes um, because those tests are coming up. And we've also been trying to think of fun things to do maybe for a spirit week. Even though we can't all be together, I know we had one um, in the winter, but we're trying to think of one to come up with for the spring to sort of get people energized before we leave school and before we have sort of AP exams. And that's really all I have. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Thank you very much. Have a good night. Um, anti-racism and equality report. Who's doing that tonight? That would be me. All right. Oh, I didn't see you, Kelsey. <laughs> I snuck in. I saw you an hour ago, but you know. Right. <laughs> um, so we had two big meetings recently. We had one, um, last Thursday and then a follow-up on Monday. Um, and the purpose of those meetings was really looking at um, sort of assessing where we are so far this year, what's gone well, what's been challenging, and what are the needs, um, trying to set ourselves up well for moving forward as we're thinking about planning for next year and beyond. Um, so one of the big themes that came up was communication, which isn't surprising. That's something that we've kind of been talking about all along. Um, being a such a large district with so many schools um, and the committee itself being so large, communication has definitely been an issue um, in terms of subcommittees communicating with each other, um, in terms of uh, admin communicating with teachers, in terms of schools communicating with other schools, and in terms of school communicating out to the community. Um, we just need to clarify those avenues um, and really make sure that folks know what we're doing. Um, because there is a lot of uncertainty and kind of ambiguity of like, okay, we're, we're doing things, but what exactly is happening? Um, and we want to be really transparent and we are proud and excited about the work that we're doing and we want to share that with the community and be really open about it. Um, so there are two ways we're talking about doing that. Um, we're looking to have some presence on the website um, so that it's obvious when you go to, to, um, to the district home um, and to the individual schools, like we're an anti-racist district and this is what that means and this is what we're working on. Um, and then we're also, um, we'll be putting out a monthly newsletter. So that's been taken on by our students actually at this point. Um, Isabel is one of our juniors who's on the committee and we have students in each of the four subcommittees. So they'll be working with some adult supervision um, to put together this monthly newsletter that will go out to all of our students, all of our faculty across all five schools um, and out to all of our, our parents and community um, so that everyone gets that update of this is what's going on and this is this is what we're doing this month um, to try to facilitate that communication um, and make sure that everyone knows what's going on so that everyone can be excited with us. Um, the other piece of having of school to community communication. Um, we were thinking about how our policy and procedures committee um, can really help with that in terms of writing up some new policies. So, so far this year, they've really been focused on um, examining the existing policies and the existing handbook. And certainly that's important and needs to be done. Um, but what we're finding is as we're kind of coming into this new territory of doing this work, um, we're running into some new situations. And so we're, we're needing some new policies of, okay, something happened, an incident happened. What do we do? Um, like what, what communication goes out to families? What communication goes out to students? What is our protocol? Like what are the steps for when something happens? So similar to how we have a bullying protocol, um, we are looking at the policy and procedure committee really making a playbook of, okay, when something happens, this is the official policy, this is how we communicate, this is what happens, um, so that we can respond in a timely manner um, and feel confident about our response um, and really make sure that we're getting that communication out to, to, the, to our community and to our students. Um, and that when we make that communication, it's always really centering our students of color and our families of color. Um, and that the purpose of those communications is sending that message that um, 
you are welcome here, you are valued here, um, and this is your community too. And we know that when we do that, uh, the message that we're sending out to everybody is we are a community that cares about each other. We are a community that has each other's backs. And really that benefits everybody, um, makes everybody feel welcome. It makes everybody feel supported um, when we when we make sure that we are especially um, supporting our most vulnerable populations. Um, so those are sort of our, our thoughts around communication um, and having that move forward. Um, the other thing that's up on the, the table because it's on the horizon is planning for professional development for next year. Um, so the feedback that we've gotten is that the elementary model of professional development this year, especially this fall, was really successful. Um, that teachers really felt like they had an opportunity to do a deep dive, um, to make, so to forge some new connections with each other. Um, and they all came out of it feeling on the same page, more or less, and kind of ready to move forward together, um, which has been a little bit different than the experience at the high school for a variety of reasons. Um, so some teachers at the high school have been kind of feeling inspired and moving forward on their own, which is great. And I think Sarah has some examples to share with you later of what those teachers have been doing. Um, but there's definitely still a need um, to, to include everybody and kind of get everybody up to speed and on the same page. Um, and that includes our support staff as well, our IAs, our athletic coaches, um, staff that interact with our students every day but aren't necessarily faculty. Um, so unfortunately this year, because of the pandemic, uh, we had them, we had our IAs often offering extra tutoring services or working with our students during PD time. So it was challenging for them um, to participate in the PD. And that's something that we'd like to, uh, we'd like to, to try and problem solve around that for next year to make sure that everyone um, who's interacting with our students and everyone who's part of our school community has access to that professional development. Um, so our PD committee and the curriculum committee have merged since those two things are kind of going hand in hand and curriculum is really the next place that we're going with professional development. Um, so they are working um, on putting that proposal together along with Sarah and Kim um, and they'll be presenting, uh, presenting that to you in April. So that is coming up. Um, and then the last thing that I want to mention is that as we are looking at, all right, where do we want to be two years from here, from now? Where do we want to be five years from now? And how do we get there? What are, what are our milestones? Um, we're also starting to think about intersectionality uh, and how, how this work applies to more than just racism. Obviously, we know that just because we're focused on racism this year, that doesn't mean that magically sexism, homophobia, ableism are suddenly fixed. Like those things are still there. Um, and those things are often interconnected with racism. We know that students of color are over-referred for IEPs. We know that one of the most dangerous demographics to belong to in terms of um, your life expectancy is, to, is being a black trans woman. Um, so these things are interconnected um, and we can be doing, we can be looking through an anti-racist lens as we look at diversity and inclusion in our curriculum across the board. So as we're going through and looking at, okay, how, how is this curriculum supporting our anti-racism work? We're also looking at, do we have representation of female authors? Do we have rep representation of queer history? Do we have representation of people with disabilities? Um, and making sure that we're really building a community where all of our students see themselves reflected in our curriculum and feel like um, they belong here and this is their community too. Does anybody have any questions for Kelsey? Judy? Not so much a question or maybe a request, I don't know, a comment. Um, it, more to the point of the um, communication, Kelsey, uh, one of the things that would really help, I think, us to digest some of the information, because we get a lot from this group uh, at every meeting, is maybe a brief synopsis report that gets uh, distributed to the school committee in the same way that the principal's report or other reports come just with like the highlight reel of what you're gonna talk about. Um, because I really do feel like as somebody who's trying to write down the minutes and communicate and follow along at the same time, I, I miss stuff. You guys throw a lot of stuff out at us that as you mentioned just tonight, covers a lot of topics. And I think some sort of high level report for the committee as this work continues, as you progress into some of the um, different areas that the students will discuss, especially as we get into deep into, you get into 
like the uh, continued PD and professional um, curriculum development, like that stuff is going to be important to us to understand um, so that we can talk about it. And it's one thing to hear about it. Um, we're not all part of the communication that comes out from Frontier if you don't have kids in the school. And so it's a way for us to stay connected to the work that you're doing if it's not going to be available to, broad, to the broader community or, you know, I don't want to just read about it in the newspaper. Absolutely. So that would be great. That would be my request. Good idea. Anybody else? Olivia? Um, I'm just wondering if, um, Kelsey, if maybe the school committee could be put on that newsletter that you were saying, you know, I happen to be at the anti-racism um, part of the policy committee and um, what I saw Isabel doing was just phenomenal and that would be really great even as someone who's on just one of those committees to see what the other committees are doing, maybe this, if the school committee could just be on the general throw out of that, yep. um, that could keep us, that could help Judy and all of us stay informed, um, even if there's something different you're gonna talk about at the meetings, but um, that would really help to keep us informed, I think, if you don't mind. Yes, absolutely, I think that makes perfect sense. Good question. Anybody else have anything for Kelsey? Judy? Uh, one more thing. I said this at the, I think, way at the beginning when we started talking about this was don't, you know, if you, when you talk about professional development, you know, speaking on behalf of the committee, feel free to include the committee in those plans to participate in the activities um, for a variety of reasons, all of which we probably all know, and I don't need to get into details to take the time, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, important work. It's interesting work. And I think it also connects us in a way that we might like, again, I'm not a parent. So, I mean, I am a parent, but not a parent of a kid in school. So, you know, it's, it's, an imp it's important to understand the depth of the work that's um, being undertaken by everybody in the school community. Thanks, Kelsey. Yeah, absolutely. We would love to have you guys um, join the PD. I think that that would be fantastic. Perfect. Anybody else? Kelsey, thanks again. I know thanks, it's a couple Kelsey. meetings tonight, but we appreciate you coming on and talking to us. Absolutely. Have a good night. You too. Bye-bye. Uh, Darius, uh, update on COVID-19. Did you just hear Biden's announcement? It just if you haven't, if you haven't again, a, you've got a I got a tweet from POTUS. Um, he uh, tweeted out that he wants all teachers vaccinated by their first vaccine by the end of the month. So that'll be interesting to see what that does, stirring it up. But that's kind of hot off the press. Of we'll see what happens there. But um, so the kind of the COVID update we are um, we you know in our second week of pool testing currently. Let me go back and forth to my notes here. Um, Frontier is at 56% uh, participation right now uh, for those who are in school. Um, 56 of those who are attending um, in person. Um, <clears throat> so it's, you know, it's rolled, that rolled out a lot smoother in operation than we expected. So we're happy about that. We wanna get those numbers up a little bit higher um, and so forth there. Um, right now, the state is also doing a push for um, pre-K to, pre to six, or pre-K to five, depending on the elementary um, breakdown of trying to get those students back into schools five days a week starting in April. I'm just saying this out loud because you're gonna be hearing about that in the news. It looks like the Board of Education, uh, for those of you who don't know the setup, there's a commissioner and a Board of Education, much like a superintendent and a school committee kind of setup where um, he gets his authority from um, that board. But he, asked, he requested from the Board of Education to require uh, schools to go back on the, the beginning of April, which is really April 5th, um, I think is the date that he has set to do. Um, that board is going to meet, I believe this Friday, I'm not sure if they've publicized the meeting yet, but that's what I heard today in a meeting, another legal meeting, um, and to make that decision, they're gonna give them the authority. Now, the first thing that comes to question as a school committee members, you say, well, aren't, isn't it about local authority on that? Yes, you will still have local authority um, where you can, um, uh, this is not gonna affect secondary right off. They're talking about starting with elementary, then rolling out middle school. And whether or not they hit the high school or not um, remains to be seen. So 
Um, it may not actually even affect Frontier by the time the rollout of things happen, but um, I think it's good if you kind of know what's going on in the politics of public education. So <clears throat> what, they, what they're going to do, so in our elementary schools that are back now four days a week with Wednesdays as remote days, um, if the school committees of those elementary schools say, like, you know, we don't want to follow the, the, the state model, what they will do is they won't count any of the hybrid remote days as time on learning. So you'll have to make up all those either hours or days at the end of the school year where you will not reach your quota for the school year and therefore run into other problems. Um, the other thing they can do to punish you is give you less chapter 70 funding, um, punish you by day that you don't attend school. Because we were asking us, that's what we're doing in our superintendents meeting, well, what are they going to do to make us? And then the attorneys kind of explained this is exactly what they're going to do. They'll take away 180th of your chapter 70 funding. So they are... This doesn't really affect us as a whole, being four days a week, the transition to five days a week is not gonna be over, not something, a hurdle that's gonna be impossible to do. Um, some of our neighboring districts and other districts around the state are in very different <laughs> setups. This is a complete change for them, a complete culture change for them as well of where they've been for COVID. So it's a big, um, it's a big topic in education, but that's kind of what's happening. Um, so they're supposed to be, again meet on Friday and then, Yes, he's supposed to give us guidance early the following week, um, which is really, um, it's gonna be a tight window. Again, not so tight for us because we're only changing one day and it's not a, we don't have a whole schedule change, but education as a whole, there's a lot of districts with very contentious um, relationships with their associations and agreements that are gonna have to be written up and that kind of stuff because they haven't been at it all in person. And I don't know how they're gonna turn that around in that kind of time. I'm not so much worried about us, um, because we're kind of in, we're in better shape and um, we'll be able to talk things through. But anyway, that's kind of the, I think, let me just make sure I didn't miss anything on my COVID update. That's kind of where we are overall um, with that. Um, yeah, any questions on the COVID, broad topic of COVID? Go ahead, Missy. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know if you have the answer to this, but how you're describing it that means that the folks who are remote now would have to go back in order no, no, i'm sorry that's okay thank that's, you, I thank you for clarify. catching that yeah they are eliminating that we had to propose three models remote only in person only and hybrid they are now going to get rid of hybrid and you'll have in person only or remote only for the remainder of this year and what's going to happen next year for if there's going to be a remote option at all for next year is still under, is still being discussed. So um, so those people who are currently remote will just stay remote. Um, those who are hybrid, one would assume would go to the, looking at the elementary would pick up that fifth day if you're in for four days. I imagine most parents would wanna pick up the fifth day. Um, the concern we're gonna have overall um, as a full district, you know, um, at the elementary is if more students start to wanna come back. Um, as people are vaccinated, people, you know, reasons for staying home or being remote isn't always about children, it might be other household members who then become vaccinated. So then they can say, you know what, we no longer have to take these levels of precautions. So when we get those larger numbers, the question will be how we'll be able to do that. And then the question, the real, one of the big questions that we're looking at for advice from the state is how do we, you know, the CDC is coming out with six foot spacing, Massachusetts is saying three to six feet, and Massachusetts doctors are kind of going against CDC doctors, um, and which is a heck of a, you know, if we were going to have a, a, a throwdown, that's kind of, you know, take the state with the best, you know, medical um, people in the country, go against the CDC. Um, so right now, the, the I, I did send out as part of the packet, I sent out the update, I send you the, the doctor's letter um, from, you know, the leading leaders in Massachusetts in, in medicine. Uh, more people are signing on to that letter that three feet and six feet, there isn't a much difference in spacing when properly PVE'd um, with men's rather and, and such. So I'm gonna have to probably be selling more of that if, talk, that's talking to you more about that if we're gonna make changes of reducing to get more students in the building um, if space becomes an issue. Right now we're gonna hold it at six feet until we get to that point. <clears throat> Good question, Missy, thanks. Da uh, Damien? Uh, yeah, I mean, to get, kind of follow along that same lines, um, how does that, and maybe this kind of inter, intercorrelates with, with the teachers being vaccinated, but it's one thing to get rid of a hybrid model 
and say we're either going to be remote or we're going to be full in person. And if we get all the kids in person, I, I know from experience right now, my daughter, when she goes to school, I think three of her classes are actually still being taught over a laptop because the teachers are at home. So she's just sitting in a cafeteria watching what she could do at home. So it's one thing to force them to go to school or not force isn't the right word, but she goes to school to be five days a week. But if all the classes that you're not all, but half of the classes she's taking, she's just watching the teacher at home. How is that? I don't know. How's that interplay with getting everyone back in school? <laughs> so. Um it's a good point. One is want to reemphasize that right now they're looking at possibly middle school in maybe May, and they're not sure if they're even going to touch secondary. So, I mean, so that doesn't even help your some of the problems that you said there. Um, as, as employers, but basically how I kind of see it in the conversations we're talking with, um, you know, our our uh, uh, labor attorney and that kind of stuff about how 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 do you go about doing this to be you know kind of um, not only fair with our teachers that needed to be out. Um, but um, also recognizing that we have to recognize that basically COVID is going to take the COVID uh, vaccination shot is going to take six weeks from the last arm that gets kind of injected. So, you know, we're hoping that they're going to come up with regional and maybe this push from, you know, the federal government now is going to help with that. But they're already they're already talking about this. There's nothing set up. But I know they're having conversations about doing vaccination centers for teachers only. Um, and then what would happen is once every teacher has the availability to get a shot um, at the end of that six weeks mark, what would happen is those teachers that are on leave would be requested to come return. Also, we have also have teachers on leave due to you know medical um, medical things related to COVID and so forth. And so each one's each one's an individual case, and they'll have to handle individual. Mm -hmm. But basically, I'd be asking for documentation as their employer to you know. And basically, that happens an annually, anyways for. Um, people who have FMLA and that kind of thing, um, or those kind of those kind of accommodations, I can ask for um, updated materials from their doctor that says even with the vaccination, this you know particular teacher still needs accommodation, or you know not providing that that, that teacher needs to return. I mean the assumption that people will be returning to work overall, but I'm just kind of saying overall if there's holdouts or that kind of stuff as employers, we're, as employers we have to deal with that on an individual basis and. and they have rights on their end, and we also have rights on our end, and, and trying to make it work um, so that people come back and they're safe and they can get back to work in the job that we hired them for. Okay. So, that, so what's the timeline on that? It's the timeline of the vaccinations on that. And I, and I basically told Frontier that, you know, that we, you know, right now, you know, we had hoped that the vaccinations were going to start in February, and I know I was, I was trying to be positive and optimistic, but in the middle of the winter, that's what you do. Um, you know, um, I've, I've told Frontier that we're not changing the model of the three days and increasing that until teachers are vaccinated. We're going to talk about once we do that, the, all the, the other side of the model is bringing more students back as well. Um, but I think that's going to kind of fall naturally um, with the timeline that even the state has put out for forced and with hopefully the vaccination and speed up. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have a question for Darius? Okay. Uh, next thing is um, a vote on school choice. Then we get the budget discussion first. Bob, just oh, just give me two I'm seconds sorry. on that. Um, I can't do what Shelly does, and and Shelly was not able to. Um, you know, sometimes we have a planned absence. You can give me materials where I can kind of present that. She was not able to do that as well, um, due to the circumstances prior to her mother passing as well. Um, so basically, um, we're running off the numbers that we ran at the last meeting. Um, you have those documents. Um, we do have a public hearing next Tuesday at six o'clock. Make sure you kind of double checking your schedules. A lot of the towns, um, several of the towns will be attending that meeting because unlike um, other years where I kind of go out and go to the, each of the towns and talk about their elementary budgets and talk about their secondary budgets and kind of give them, because in the town's perspective, remember that education is kind of like one one line item of, of their of the needs of each town. So. The issue this year is that the elementary, because the towns have pushed off all of their um, town meetings to June, we're not rushing the elementary budgets. And it's, that's, for those of you who are not on the elementary committees, that's important because there's a lot of issues with the elementary budgets that, we, 
that we, you know, we don't know what the kindergarten enrollment is. We don't know what the preschool enrollment is in those revolving funds and those kind of things. We need to have the, the more accurate we are in those numbers, the better, more accurate our budget can be um, in projecting some of those things out. And so, you know, I've kind of asked the town to let us kind of, you know, wait this out and really come back. We'll do our public hearings for the elementary budgets in April, um, in April for the most part. Um, so Frontier has to get it done by the end of March. So we have our public hearing. So usually I, we don't have many people coming to it. We have a few, um, we'll be more at our meeting next week. So Shelly will make the adjustments to where we, you know, where we discussed it last meeting. We are still at the, um, the numbers to, um, we still are at the two seven, I mean, two nine seven number. Um, and she will be able to walk through. Remember at that public hearing, we still can, after getting input from the towns, have a discussion, make any changes, or we can have another meeting, or we can make you know changes and vote that budget that evening. So there's still plenty of time within our budget cycle. I, I'm not really, um, I'm not concerned at all that Shelly can't be here this evening. Um, not that there was any real choice in that matter as well, but um, I think that we're, our budget's in good shape and we have a meeting next week where we can have the full discussion if there's anything. Going through any of that, if you have questions on that, um, you know, if, if you're not tonight, shoot me an email or shoot me and Shelly an email. That way we can make the adjustments, have the adjustments ready or questions ready so you get all the information you need at next Tuesday's meeting. So, you know, if we are ready to move on, we don't have to hold off on one question where we didn't have a chance to research. Does that make sense everywhere in the, in the, in the budget talk? And if there's anything I know you'd want. Thank you. Okay. Um, now I guess we can do the school choice vote. I, I got a quick, choice. I got a quick question, Bob, about that. Just, oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. Sorry. I, I was late. I was late dialing. I didn't see, like, I did see your hand up this before. evening. That's Go all right. Ahead, Phil. So, Derek, so I, I did get, you know, I, I saw that the finance committees and whatnot from the different towns were invited to that March 9th, but, um, could you send out the budget or some sort of summary to them too, so that they're not just seeing it for the first time when they get to our meeting? Yes. yes. Thanks. That's it. Glad you made it, Phil. <laughs> okay, we'll jump over to school choice. Um. George prepared. Or George want to take it? Yeah, George prepared a doc. George, you want to go through it and talk about what your thoughts are this year? So basically, everybody should have gotten a document from Donna Hathaway this afternoon that that outlined the school choice numbers. Uh, uh, basically, um, based on what what I'm seeing this year compared to previous years, uh, the numbers are uh, uh, right now the the applications, the pending applications, are a little bit lower. Uh, but we are recommending um, once again that that we're we're going to be looking for less than five students for the seventh grade, uh, five or thereabouts for, for eighth grade, uh, hopefully five for ninth, 10, 10, 10 and 10 for 10th, 11th and 12th. Um, you know, uh, the, the, the numbers might tick up in terms of the application, the pending applications, but, but um, you know, I would hope that we could still move forward with school choice like we always do. I, I hope that, you'd, uh, that you, would, you would give it the go ahead so we continue to do this because it's definitely going to help us. I know in the in the past we always make sure that we you know we trust you with the making any judgment calls, you know it's your discretion and stuff. So that's what we've done in the past. Does anybody else have anything mm -hmm. they want to say about school choice? If not, then how about a motion and a second? Motion. Who second it? Sorry, didn't hear. Bill or Olivia. Okay, thank you. Uh, roll call, Bob Halla? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Bill? Yes. Li Olivia? Yes. Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Yeah. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Bill? Yes. All right, we're all set. Thank you. Uh, we're going to talk about fall sports number two, fall sports, spring sports. So 
I, we have Carl Sierra on here with tonight, our athletic director. So basically, just to get, do the quick intro, um, they, well, you can give the intro to Carl. I talked too much tonight. What is fall two, and what are you talking about for those of us who don't have kids playing sports? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so fall two, um, basically the sports that we pushed off having games for in the fall, the original fall, fall one, as it's sometimes referred to as, um, have been moved. So football, volleyball, boys and girls soccer. That's what we're looking at. Um, and this was because of the numbers in the fall and, and the MIA, all that kind of stuff. So um, this season would run until April 25th. And then um, the spring season, which used to start at the end of March, would start right after that uh, on the 26th and go through actually um, July, the start of July. Um, I bring up the spring season only because that's going to be here in no time. So we got to, as we're talking about fall two now, we have to start thinking about um, the meeting that we will also talk about the spring sports, um, which just just to get that on your mind that that's that's going to be here super fast. This is only uh, what is it seven weeks for this fall two season. So um, the MIA, the EEA, they have all approved fall two for the sports that we want to have. Um, you know, it, in terms of the things we're going to do, it, it's all it's you know the obviously follow every guideline and then some. Um, we came off the basketball season, which I want to say. Um, was was super positive. We didn't have to move any games. The coaches and the kids were amazing in terms of uh, if they, they had a little sore throat, they didn't go to practice. And the coaches told me, and then I had the nurses reach out to those kids. Um, it was the coaches did a great job keeping attendance, all that stuff. It was, it really went as smoothly as possible. Um, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine it have gone any better for basketball. Um, and then, so we're going to all wear masks all the time in soccer. Even some of the rules have changed from the fall where if a team was playing soccer, a different school played soccer, they could take their mask down during the game, even though they were outside, you know, if they were 10 yards away from somebody rules like that are, are have changed. So they're, they have to have the mask on at all times. Um, so I think the schools that played in the fall, they learned stuff from that fall, which is benefiting us now in this fall two season where they've, change the rules to, to, to make it easier for officials and safer for everybody. Um, so other things we're still going to have, um, you know, for volleyball is the only indoor sport. Um, so, which is obviously less contact than basketball was, but they're still obviously wearing masks, sanitizing all the time, all that type of stuff. Uh, we're still planning to only play in the Franklin County bubble mm -hmm. with the other schools. The other schools have all been approved. Uh, we're just waiting for Mohawk, who's got a meeting next next week, to, um, to get their sports approved. Um, games would be limited, just like other seasons so far. Um, football would only play four games. Volleyball would play ten. Soccer um, eight. Um, middle school sports. We, looking at the numbers, it's looking like other schools won't be able to offer middle school competitively. So we're basically looking at varsity and JV taking some of those middle schoolers up to play on our JV teams. Um, and if, if that's not possible due to numbers, then offering some sort of practice kind of like we did in the fall with middle school teams. Um, fans and attendance. I know this is a hot topic in that um, for the winter it was and going forward in terms of being outside for most of the sports, um, you know, they they're starting to lift more and more, um, restrictions. Um, so anything that we would do if spectators are approved would obviously be um, at least as strict, if not stricter than any sort of guidelines that are out there. Uh, we would continue doing our contact tracing, keeping phone numbers of people who are there. Uh, I've talked to FCAT about live streaming. They're going to continue to live stream as much as they possibly can. Um, the only complication it seems that might be for them is that if we play soccer games at JV University, it'd be at the same exact time. Um, but you know, he said he, um, Kevin Murphy said we could probably figure something out. So I took that to mean they're magical and they can take they can take care of it because they love doing that stuff. Um, other things, transportation guidelines have shifted a bit. So um, we we've actually been lucky in that families have provided a lot of transportation. I think I mentioned in a previous meeting where um, the boys basketball team there's about 24 members in the varsity and JV. But in an away game, the, I think the most amount of kids at one time on a bus to an away game was uh, eight to ten. 
So most parents are giving rides, so there wasn't that many kids on a bus. Um, and then I know Donna, I think it was last week, shared with you the sports-specific guidelines, which um, unless you have specific questions about, um, I, I had the link in that thing for you guys to take a peek at. Um, you know, uh, some general things. You know, I know Scott is ordering these full head kind of covers that that are approved and like it's like a mask built into the thing so it doesn't fall off when they're taking off their helmets and putting them back on. Um, volleyball, the same as the fall, they've they've tweaked some rules to fit even better for this this fall two season. Um, and same thing with soccer. Um, so that's kind of the general gist of sports. Um, games right now we have schedules set tentatively for uh, volleyball wouldn't start till the 17th of March. Uh, soccer and football wouldn't start until the last week of March. Um, obviously we're waiting for the fields to, to um, you know, the snow to melt and fields to be able to be played on. So, you know, uh, the football has been using the parking lots. Um, soccer team is gonna use some of the tennis courts for a while um, and volleyball is in the gym. So um, that's kind of the gist. If we have questions, comments, concerns, fire away. Carl, I have a question about the outdoor sports with spectators. Is that something that is probably going to be allowed with uh, those parents or kids wearing masks on the sidelines if they're watching a, a football game or a soccer game? Is that going to be like one of these mandatory things that they, you know, have to do? Or what do you, what have you heard or – you mean in terms of if we have to let them have let there be fans, or if they have to wear masks if they're there? Well, if there's if there's spectators on the sidelines of the outdoor sports, yep. are they going to be required to wear mask outdoors? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, of that, course. I, 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 in, like in the fall, we did it, and it was two per home um, player. And I would, you know, at the at the least, I would say tracking wise to keep it to home spectators because then it's easier for us to control and track, uh, you know, it keeps less people from other areas in the area, you know, in our area. Um, but yeah, spec that, what do you call it? Masks. Absolutely. That, that would, you know, be part of my job walking around telling people to make sure you, I wouldn't even let them into the you know football stadium without them, to be honest. Got it. Thank you. Yep. Anybody else have any questions for Carl? Oh, I'm sorry, Lynn. I saw your hand. Uh, okay, go ahead. Lynn, you go first. Um, um, so I've got a question about locker rooms. I knew you would. <laughs> <laughs> you know I talked to Abby. I saw Abby today. <laughs> go ahead. Well, you know the question. So the girls, you know, we understand they wanted to not have the girls cluster in the locker room. So now the girls are clustering in the bathroom, um, which is kind of gross. And there are more of them, and it's taking longer. So what's the movement on opening up locker rooms for these girls? Sure. So uh, I looked back in the paperwork. It, it is an MIA rule that they shouldn't, locker rooms shouldn't be used. Um, you know, and I was talking to Scott Dredge today about this after Abby talked to me. And, um, you know, one of the things is that school ends at 2.15 for those kids that have practice. And, um, and volleyball doesn't start until 2.45 right? Yeah, 245. So there's a half hour there. And thinking about the bathrooms, there's three stalls. And um, if we can't use the locker rooms, they don't, I, I was saying today to the players, well, don't pile in there, you know, spend, send a couple in at a time, because you have a half hour for, you know, those girls to change. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure what to do in terms of that, because that's a rule that's above us. I mean, I totally understand it. Um, I'm not sure how you police the locker rooms in that sense, especially the girls one, because I can't go in there and make sure they're doing the right thing. Um, I think the the idea behind it is that kids in general, boys or girls, will go in the locker room and like hang out and, and chat and talk. And, you know, that's what it has been historically. Um, so I'm not sure if we can set up a thing for – the coach to say like, okay, here's the rotation. There's kids that are at school today. You three, you know, you have this, these five minutes in the locker room, they get down here first. Then the next five minutes is, you know, and they have like a rotation. Um, Cause that would solve the problem of more than three going in there. Um, yes. And there's three stalls. Um, it's not like an open space where 
in the bathroom or someone opened the door, you could see the girls changing or anything like that or anybody changing. So I guess that's my short answer. Um, yeah, not really short answer actually. Missy, do you have a question? You got to unmute. Sorry, I thought I hit it. Um, I, I have a couple questions. One is also along that line, especially when you look at uh, teams that have larger rosters, uh, like with football and kind of these, right? So you have natural breaks in the game where there may be groups of people who go uh, all at the same time. How How, how is that going to be? navigated in terms of just using the bathroom or you mean like football in the locker room or any of these spaces where you have like an entire team that all has a break at the same time yeah do whatever you need to do yes um well so for football they're not using the locker rooms either um they're 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 using a space for those shoe kids that uh, for the kids that are in school to like store their gear during the day, um, Scott has set it up so they just drop their stuff off that that, that room. Um, they're going to be outside most of the time. Where there's, we ordered extra porta potties um, in the in the fall that are still there, so that in the back with all the extra kids out there, there's more places to go. Um, and you know, um, in terms of kids also coming like right after school, they, you know, we ask them, they they're ready to go like rec league, you know, um, in that sense. Um, I don't have a perfect answer for, I mean, we made it through the fall with the teams that were out there where we had, you know, uh, field hockey, cross country, and well, golf was off campus, but those two teams playing games and practicing along with the other teams just practicing. And there didn't seem to be any sort of um, kind of like pile up at the, at the locker room or anything like that. So um, not the locker room, the, the porta potty. So. Well, that sounds like that mitigates it by moving the restrooms outdoors. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, and I guess the other question is, do you anticipate that that eight to 10 folks who are traveling by transportation is gonna hold true when you have a larger roster with football? So, um, so to be clear too, the, uh, football, you say larger roster, but there's 26 kids signed up. Um, and it, in the rules for that, any kids who are injured or ineligible to play for any reason, they're not supposed to go to the games. So right there, we'll have, you know, we're, we're going to end up with actually probably less kids traveling for football than, than normally. We have less kids. I mean, last year in the fall, I think there was 35 kids who had signed up. And this year, like I said, 26 minus those injured and other kids that might not be playing. Um, so, I, you know, I have it set up and I talked to the coaches the other day at the, at the kind of preseason meeting and said, we'll have to, as games get closer, take a survey and see where we're at so that, you know, if we have to have uh, two buses, then we have two buses because, you know, we need to offer that bus for parents. We're not going to try to inconvenience parents, um, but we also need to keep, keep the spacing. So it's two buses then it's two buses. And I don't know if, uh, this last question, uh, I just, in terms of fans who are attending these, I just want to kind of see if we can make clear the school committee uh, purview and the board of health purview. I think that, uh, you know, we vote on whether or not the, the sports are, are happening and we're, but the board of health is going to be the one who navigates how many folks are able to go to the stands and all those types of things. Correct. I think that is true. I'm still relatively new at this job, but yes, I think that's true. And we, and some of the coaches and I too have been working on plans as like kind of getting ready for that so that we, you know, we don't just show up and like, hey, what do we do? You know, so we've been working on some ideas and stuff that can be molded into what works for everybody. Thank you. Yep. Damien, you got a question? Uh, not so much a question, just a comment, and I'll just really try to make it quick. Um, one thing uh, my daughter learned between last fall, ski club this year, and then going forward with doing this fall two flex, whatever you want to call it for soccer, what her plan is do, is to do. And I don't know if you make, you can't obviously force kids to do it or force parents, whatnot, but a suggestion um, she's, you know, school gets out at what two o'clock, two fifteen, or whatever, but soccer doesn't start until three 30. 
uh, with skiing this year, you know, the ski bus left at three o'clock. So rather than haul the stuff down to the school and really there was nowhere to go, you know, in years past, you would do homework in the library, whatnot, and kind of kill some time. But now, since you can't even do that, she just comes home, changes out her gear, you know, clothing, whatnot, and not even deal with the locker room. And then, you know, one of us just buzzers, buzzes her back down to school. Now, granted, we live a mile away from school. It doesn't necessarily work for Conway and Waitley and, you know, other kids. But, you know, it might, it might be a suggestion, you know, to kids and parents that if they can make it work rather than filling up the locker room, you know, just do using that 45 minutes, come home, swap things out, <clears throat> and then go back to practice or, or you know, whatever you're doing. Yeah, and I know coaches will be more flexible. Like in the fall, at first, cross country wanted to start practice at two thirty, and we realized, oh wait, we can't do that. There's people who take long. You know, school ends at two fifteen, and it takes longer for them to get here. Um, you know, and the coaches, like the other night, uh, the boys soccer coach had a meeting, and you know, he said he's going to talk to the players and be like, time wise, you know, it might make more sense instead of starting at three to start at three thirty for that very reason. So, you know, the coaches understand at this point what every kind of how it's just different and you got to kind of be a little more flexible. So um, yeah, that's a great point. If you can go, go home and grab your stuff, that, that makes more sense. Thanks, Damien. Anybody else have a question for Carl? Missy again? Go ahead. Is there a larger area in the school that they could congregate as opposed to the bathroom? You mean just to to hang out or to change? Or? Like that's what they may be doing in the bathroom. They can go to the bathroom to change and then go congregate in a larger area that's not so close together. Um, I'm not so. I'm trying to think. Like, like outside, Missy. Yeah, <laughs> they could certainly go outside. Yes. Like you know, there's large areas like an auditorium, or you know, I mean, like there are some bigger rooms in the school. Well, I can say for, for volleyball um, that they might not pra start practice at 245, but, you know, when the kids the kids that are at school, they start setting up the nets before that because that takes a little while. Um, and, Scott, I put you, you put your hand up, so I'm guessing you may have some things to say to that. Go for it. Uh, yes, I arranged, you know, for the football players in the middle school football team um, an opportunity in the auditorium that I supervise – um, socially distanced, very much like our internet cafe during the school day, um, where we can have those kids, you know, f like, like the volleyball team's doing, you know, a, a few at a time going to the bathroom and, and changing for their practice. But also while they're in the auditorium waiting for practice to start is a great opportunity for them to have like a study hall so they can get some homework done. And that's what we started yesterday during, um, you know, waiting for the start of practice. We had kids who were in school hang out there. Um, and there was uh, several middle school football players that took advantage of that. And I had a couple of younger um, varsity players, you know, that would be JV, but like freshmen and sophomores also do that as well. And I was in there. Um, and actually it was a great opportunity to um, check in with them, you know, post school day and see how they're doing, where they're at. Um, and it was a good opportunity for me uh, to get to know a lot of the middle school players a little better. I did coach a lot of them in youth football, but also just kind of set the tone that, you know, you're also, this is a good opportunity for you to be, you know, continue being a student, getting your work, homework done because, um, you know, with sports, uh, the biggest complaint I'm getting from parents is, is how late kids are staying up doing homework. So this is a great opportunity for at least an hour to get some homework done. Uh, so that's what we set up. And, you know, we we'll, I'll take, I'll take on soccer players as well. It doesn't matter. There's plenty of room in the auditorium. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Anybody else have a question for either Scott or Carl? Okay. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to approve the fall two sports. Do we have a second? I'll second it. Okay. Bob? Yeah, hold on. Any other discussion on this? Okay. Okay. Bob? Yes. Lynn? Yes. Phil? Yes. Olivia? Yes. 
Judy, yes. Mary? Yes. Damien? Yes. Keith? Yes. Missy? Yes. Bill? Yes. All right, all set. Thank you. So the, what usually follows up after that is that the Board of Health is now going to have a meeting on, when, uh, they moved it, they're going to now have it on Friday at five o'clock, the same thing to um, approve the competitions as well. So I had to wait for the group, this body to approve the sports, and then they're going to approve the competitions. Um, basically, based on the, you know, my conversations with them, I've had several, um, you know, the, Right now, the numbers are good. I don't see a problem moving it forward. They just want to be clear that if things change, then we have to change what we're doing, which I think we all know going into this. So um, they're going to have a, a brief meeting, I'm told, on Friday at 5. We will post a frontier meeting as well. Um, again, um, because the numbers are so low, I don't consider. I don't think it's going to be that um, hopefully an exciting of a meeting. It'll be straightforward. Thank you. Um, I guess, is Sarah Mitchell around? Mm -hmm. I'm here. You're gonna get... <laughs> so, I know you were here, here for a reason to talk to us about professional development. Yes, yes. So I'm going to go in a, a few different directions. Um, thanks so much for entertaining us at uh, this late hour. Um, and I've also got uh, Laura here, Moore with, here with me and uh, Max Cheryl here with me. And they'll be uh, chiming in towards the end of the presentation. Um, I'm going to share a couple of documents with you to start out with. So the first document is the actual presentation because I know how frustrating it can be not to be able to see the slides. And the second document that I'm sharing with you is um, a curriculum update um, to share all the great work that's been happening at Frontier and our teachers have been doing with the professional development we've had this year. So I'm gonna share my screen now <clears throat> and feel free to peruse those, through those documents as we're talking. Okay, can everyone see that okay? Yep. Okay, um, so we're gonna focus a little bit our uh, most of the presentation on um, what we've been working on this year, which is the culturally relevant teaching and learning. And I wanted to give you a little bit of background history. Um, some of the major themes of professional development that we've covered through the years, um, and we could go back um, to the year 2000, um, but I decided to um, uh, just focus on 2013 through present. So we tend to spend several years working on particular themes. So as you can see, for a couple of years, we worked on uh, writing across the curriculum, um, the John Collins model, we spent a couple of years working with Mike Anderson um, around differentiation through student choice. Um, the last three years, we've worked on assessment. Um, we've had a variety of presenters and done a, um, a few book study groups. Um, and this year, one of the central themes is the anti-racism work. Um, we've had the Radical Empathy Consulting Group come in from the University of Massachusetts. Um, this isn't the only professional development we do in a year. We often have more than one um, set of themes running through. We always have technology workshops. We're always working on specific curriculum content, uh, but we tend to have themes that um, are more dominant and tend to be multi-year. Um, to drill down specifically on the social justice work, um, we have done some workshops um, in the past on social, uh, specifically around social justice, um, starting in 2017. Some of these workshops have been um, for the entire faculty. Uh, we talk about um, bias, implicit bias workshop with the collaborative. Some of the workshops have been done by our frontier faculty members. Um, and then as Kelsey mentioned, uh, racism doesn't live alone. Um, and so we've done some workshops on uh, sexism, um, homophobia and all sorts of um, different content areas. So this is not necessarily a new topic to Frontier, um, but we are putting um, a lot more energy into this topic starting this year, um, obviously because the national focus and um, the different pieces that have come up. So this year specifically, we're focusing on three different areas, and this is a little bit of a re review from early fall. Um, obviously, we had to 
dig deep and we had to have a lot of professional development on strengthening remote learning um, because even in the hybrid model, as you're all familiar, there's a lot of remote learning in the hybrid model. Area number two was the new special ed delivery model. Um, that's at the high school level where special educators are not doing uh, standalone skills classes throughout the day. Uh, they're pushing into classrooms. They're working with small groups. Um, that looks a little bit different this year. Um, and then focus area three, which we'll talk about tonight, is the anti-racism, racism, the social justice, and the equity. So we spent about 10 and a half hours in workshops uh, this fall. And this spring, we have six hours planned. Um, and again, most of the workshops have been with the Radical um, Empathy Consulting Group. So we had three goals. Uh, the Anti-Racism Professional Development uh, Committee met and they developed goals. And so goal one was to expand our knowledge um, about the history of racism, reflect on our own identities, and uh, talk about systemic racism. So we are well on our path to meeting those goals this year. Um, and then we, in April, um, we'll be coming back, uh, Kim McCarthy and myself will come back and we'll present a plan for next year uh, for all the professional development next year. Um, some of the fall workshop titles that we participated in, we had a couple of introductory uh, workshops which were done by our own faculty. Um, and you can see from the titles, a lot is about uh, the self in society, um, really um, a lot of identity work, uh, which is very similar to what the elementary school, they had a slightly different format that they used in their professional development. Uh, but they're the same types of themes about really um, self-examination um, and looking at what you're doing in the classroom. The next set of workshops, uh, that's one started on December 9th and will continue into the spr uh, spring, is around um, having difficult conversations, engaging in difficult dialogue, um, and, and being uncomfortable as we engage in this work. This spring, um, I put together a committee of, um, of teachers. Um, they volunteered. We have representation from all of the departments. And you can see we are going to start on curriculum work. And it won't specifically be about um, necessarily anti-racism and the culturally responsive curriculum, but it will be a part of that work. Um, we, uh, about 10 or actually about 15 years ago now, adopted a model, um, the Atlas curriculum model. Um, it's a software that we're using as a storage for all of our curriculum. Um, we've been using it a long time. It's been a great tool for us and a great resource, but it's really time to move on. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot with formatting and really focusing on the areas of professional development that we covered over the last 10 years. So the three highlighted areas that we are, need to figure out a way to incorporate into um, our model going forward is the differentiation through student choice, which we spent a few years on, uh, the assessment, which is already part of our current curriculum maps, um, but we'll need to expand that, and then, of course, the culturally relevant curriculum. Um, I've also shared the second document that I shared with you as a curriculum update. Um, after the last meeting, several of you had asked um, me to um, bring back an update about what teachers were doing. Um, I remember Keith McFarland saying that he was already doing some of this work in his classroom, um, even without necessarily direct um, professional development on it. Um, and teachers are doing a lot of work in this area. Some teachers have spent their entire careers doing this work. Other faculty are new to this work. Um, but I was flooded with examples. Um, this is just a sampling of the examples. Uh, there's many, many other teachers that um, are not included in this newsletter. Maybe they'll be in the next newsletter. Uh, but you can see we have pretty good representation from uh, most of our departments. And I've asked uh, Laura Moore and Max to be here this evening. Thank you very much for waiting. Um, and I'm gonna turn over the stage to Laura so she can talk specifically about what this looks like in her classroom. And Laura, I realized that um, in presenting my screen, I've lost my visual. So I'm gonna uh, try to bring up another computer because I have the um, I have the slides for sharing. So Laura, you may have to shout out when you need your next slide. Okay, actually, I, I have slides too. 
Ah, okay. excellent. Do you want to share? Um, well, actually, I, I can't. I'm just able to see it, but I can't really share it with you from where okay. I'm There we go. There we go. Okay. No, no worries. Yes, I'll keep sharing. So you just let me know when to go on to the next slide. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Laura Moore. For those that don't know me, um, thank you for having me. This is my 15th year at Frontier, and I teach uh, U.S. history. I teach a street law class, the Bill of Rights class, government, AP government. And first, with U.S. history classes, like Sarah pointed out, um, for me anyway, and I think I can speak for other social studies teachers, um, much of the work we've already done uh, surrounding, um, well, the social justice work that we've been talking about, um, I focus on these kinds of issues just naturally anyway because of the subjects I teach. So much of these issues are integrated and woven throughout each course anyway. I don't need to do like a separate standalone um, segment on anything. It's just woven throughout the course. For example, the U.S. history classes, what I teach U.S. history too, right, right before the Civil War, moving forward. So, for example, during the Civil War period, I show the movie Glory, um, speaking to African-Americans and their contributions in the Civil War. The students write essays about the Civil War in the period known as Reconstruction. I use uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' uh, book, The Souls of Black Folk, which is awesome. And I have some other examples here, but I know that time is ticking. So um, I'm imagining, Sarah, like people could see this like afterwards. This is something they'd have access to. Yeah, so I share the okay. presentation with everyone, and then we will put it okay. on the website also so people can okay, refer back to I it. Could, yeah, I could blab on and on, but you probably don't want me to do that. Okay, now the street law class um, and also the Bill of Rights class, when I get to that, um, I would just like everybody to know what's great about the social studies department and just a great, I think, about our school in general is that the administration has always been very supportive and encouraging all of us to, um, you know, if there's like a, a topic we're really interested in or um, uh, a course that we would like to develop to present it and, uh, write up a suggestion and um, you know put out an idea and if if it's something that looks like it would work then we just put it out into the curriculum if kids sign up for it then we're good to go i bring that up because street law and the bill of rights class i focus on that um it was a focus for me for a while because i found even with government class and u.s history class there were so many issues that are um we need to dive into more, okay? For example, in government class, lots of issues around, um, I'll say voting rights, uh, the criminal justice system, just the law in general. And I found that lots of students are interested in not just the law, but say um, becoming a police officer, things like that. So anyway, um, a course I had taken um, in Washington DC focused on the law and the Supreme Court. So for example, the course I teach now, street law, one thing we do is we focus on issues of criminal justice, which is something that's coming up well, consistently the last few years, especially. So you could see here, uh, Brian Stevenson, you may or may not have heard of him, uh, wrote the book, uh, Just Mercy, and he's a lawyer, has been working for quite some time with um, people in prison and people that may have been um, wrongly convicted. So that's a focus and the kids really get into that. Um, that kind of thing. It's just really interesting. Uh, we have many discussions and debates, and hopefully we'll have more face-to-face -face discussions and debates sometime soon. Um, talk a lot about the death penalty, which students are also very interested in. Um, it's That's really something they're very interested in talking about. Okay, so Sarah, you want to go to the next one? The Bill of Rights is something I just started this year, and again, the administration was great. I was like, I know I already teach government, I already teach AP government. We already do US history, the constitution. I mean, and we want a class on the Bill of Rights. Yes, we do. Because I'm finding students really, really want to know like more about like say free speech, the first amendment, um, the fourth amendment, search and seizure, uh, the issues around inequality, that kind of stuff. And how the Bill of Rights um, has applied to all of us and how, especially in the, the very beginning of our history as a country, how the Bill of Rights did not apply to everybody. So I dive into that first, and I'm starting to use the uh, Teaching Hard History segment on the Learning for Justice website, which is great, 
that used to be called uh, teaching tolerance. Um, and then we, again, we talked about the constitution. Um, I also started using the 1619 project um, and they have some great essays speaking to the issue of um, the sin of slavery and how so many people were not included um, in our country really from the very beginning. So I'm trying to make this class very unique and that yes, of course, we talk about the constitution but more specifically about the first 10 um, amendments to the constitution. Okay. Government and politics. Eyes in the prize. Many of you have probably already seen this. I use this government politics. I use it in US history too. It's an excellent, um, excellent um, site and it focuses a lot on, well, pretty much the civil rights movement. So we talk a lot about that. And um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 obviously is something very um, relevant like right now, uh, as we speak right now, Supreme Court today just heard another argument regarding this issue of whether or not the Voting Rights Act is going to be dismantled a little bit more. Time will tell, we'll find out. But anyway, this is something students are very interested in because um, voting, voting rights, disenfranchisement, a lot of the drama surrounding 2020, very relevant right now. And speaking to um, groups that have been disenfranchised, um, yeah, throughout history. And then another um, book I've used in the past, which is great, um, this professor named Cornell West, you may have heard of him. He wrote a book called Race Matters, and I've used excerpts from that book uh, to speak to this issue of race and racism. And still, even though that was written in 1993, still relevant today. Um, okay. Is there another one I'm supposed to go to? <laughs> That's it. Thank you very much, Laura, oh. unless you have some parting thoughts. No, I just, I know the times are ticking, but anybody ever has any questions, just send me an email. I'm happy to talk more about it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Laura. Right. Thanks. I'd like to turn the stage over to Max Sherrill now, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, music ensemble. All right. Hi, I'm Max Sherrill, the band and choir director <clears throat> for grades 7 through 12. And um, so I have two lessons here, two concepts uh, that I wanted to go over um, when we started this year. Um, just to set the stage a little bit, obviously, uh, playing arranged music orchestrated for a full band where everyone's playing together is just not feasible right now. So I spend my a lot of time working on just finding important melodies to important pieces of music, arranging them so that everyone could play the melody, everyone could engage in it. And with the focus that every week we're doing a lot of melodies, whereas in the normal year we're doing four or five pieces per concert cycle. Now we're doing four or five pieces per week. So the second week of the school year, uh, we I turned our attention to social justice anthems with all the Black Lives Matter protests that have been going on in the late spring into throughout this whole summer. Um, and just the state of everything at that period of time at the beginning of the school year, uh, feels like a lifetime ago. Um, it, this felt particularly, um, just felt like it resonated. So we discussed what are social justice anthems, freedom songs, um, civil rights songs, uh, what impact can they have, and you know what about them makes them effective. And so by engaging in them, some songs we shall overcome, lift every voice and sing, uh, which is the Black National Anthem, blown in the wind, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, it's a freedom song. By engaging in them, learning how to actually perform them um, and learning the lyrics, uh, it was an effective way for the students to step into some of those different um, social issues and, and just take a look around, I think. Um, so, you know, the students reflected on it, uh, created some new lyrics, um, and uh, were able to perform some of those anthems. Can go to the next slide. And this is the sort of thing that the students are see during their lessons, I have parts arranged for every instrument. Um, they follow along as I play or sing, or we watch as many different versions of these songs by different groups um, representing different walks of life and different styles of music. Um, again, the idea being just representation. Um, and uh, there you can just see some of the lyrics. Sarah, I don't know if you would want me to play or not, uh, but I think we're all... <laughs> Probably wanting to. 
move along. Um, so uh, the second sort of idea here is that, um, I mean, I'm happy to, I mean, you know, if you want to hear some trombone at 7.15 at night, hey. Um, the, uh, the second idea here was uh, a little bit more direct with the idea of, oh, George, yeah, hey. Do a little. We can we can demonstrate how it doesn't work playing together online. Um, <laughs> um, so the the second idea here is um, confronting the idea of, of systemic racism and specifically looking at curriculum as a, a place where we we can see this and see it as bias. So the students uh, were signed to watch the movie I'm Not Racist, Am I? Which introduced this concept of prejudice plus power equals racism, which was rather controversial and somewhat new, I suppose, for a lot of students and for me. Um, and uh, so we asked some some tough questions, had some discussions. You know, is uh, you know according to that definition, is just banned participate in this sort of racist system? Uh, and how can we be anti-racist? And um, you know, a lot of students coming to the conversation, we're talking a lot about bigotry, uh, you know, and treating people kindly, and we should be very welcoming, but not so much seeing the second aspect of that, which is how is bias being reflected in curriculum? So um, we had a little lesson, you can, next slide. There you go. And um, just discussing how looking at at curriculum, and I hope that this is something they would turn their attention towards in all their classes, which is to reflect on what what can racism look like, um, just in how things are represented, who is represented in history, and and everything that we do, art. Um, so the idea here is, in band repertoire is our curriculum, um, and so I choose a repertoire, and the sources I draw in for that are what I was taught in school, my knowledge. And then any new music that's put out by publishers, retailers, and professional conferences. And most of this music, overwhelmingly, is written by white men. Um, it comes from our Eurocentric tradition of, of classical music. And this, examining this, this is a form of systemic racism. So the counter to that is representation. And so um, you know, I stated to the students, my goal has always been to be representative in the music that we perform but especially now turning an even closer attention to who's writing the music, who are we watching perform music? Um, what's the music about? Um, because even if you talk about arranged music, like say, you know, Bruno Mars has a song that comes out, it's a big hit and it gets arranged for band. Usually it's a white person arranging that music. So just trying to be conscious of what's going on in the, in the total experience that we have. So, um, the next slide is just purposefully blurred out, but this is the Padlet. So the students are posting different ideas. They can see and they can comment and, and um, we got some really great ideas generated there. And is that it? Oh yeah. The other thing is, um, which came up, especially with our instructions and some of the materials that were provided by the administration going into Black History Month, which is, we don't want these things to be token. We want to avoid tokenism and just, okay, I'm gonna do a lesson on jazz, great. Um, and so my goal this year, which I love that word intersectionality, I, I'm realizing now that some of this kind of falls into that, which is just that every week we want to be bringing in different cultures, people of a variety of backgrounds that reflect society at large in the music that we do. So these are just some of the other I, topics that I think are re related um, that uh, we've explored so far this year. And uh, currently with Women's History Month, we're looking at a lot of female performers, composers, and songwriters. And I look forward to um, all so much more possibilities for other, other things we can do as well. So thank you. Great, thank you very much, Max. Um, so I think seeing what, um, sorry, I'm gonna, exit out of full screen again so I can actually see everyone. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the great things about working with this group of educators and our teachers in general, I mean, we're just, we're just so lucky. Um, I feel really fortunate every day to come to work and work with um, people that have such a high level of expertise in their content area. Um, and they're able to take the professional development that we're working on and apply it to their content area. Um, you know, Max, 
didn't go to a specific um, band workshop on how to adjust or adapt his curriculum to racism uh, or to an anti-racism curriculum, um, but he knows his content so well that he's able to do that. And I think you'll see examples in that newsletter or in that uh, curriculum update um, from a lot of different departments and a lot of um, what our educators are doing. Um, so I want to actually thank the committee for requesting an update um, because I was able to send that out and, and get so many examples and um, examples. Thanks. Do we have any questions for Sarah or Laura or Max? Keith? I don't have a question, but just a more statement or a compliment. Uh, so thank you for the presentation. I thought it was really great. Um, and just some of the things that I noticed in there is in doing that work, there's there's not a, a focus on negativity and all the, you know, the bad, horrible things. I'm seeing positivity, which is really important. I'm seeing the joy in the work. It's contemporary, which is really important. So it's not dated because anything that's beyond two weeks is old for high school students. But this is really contemporary work, which uh, motivates them. At, at like Max and, and Kelsey both said, there's a lot of intersectionality uh, to it. And um, compliments to the administration for allowing the flexibility to do this work on the fly. So I thought I saw a lot of good things happening there. So just my compliments. If someone's got their hand up, I don't see everybody. So if somebody wants to just chime in, if not. The, the only thing I want to say, I want to say thank you to the teachers that came out today and, and Sarah for putting that together. Um, please take a moment to read through the, what do you call, what's the title of the document, Sarah, that you showed me with all the, all the different, um, so many teachers just, provided information, took time to, they wanted to show, because I think one of the other things I hope people are watching at home, um, when we talk about anti-racism work and what does that look like when it hits the curriculum, there's a lot of different examples and a lot of different subject areas. If you're not in education, in education, you, you, it was really like, what is this all this, what is it they're talking about? And there's just some wonderful examples, I thought, in that, in, in you know, Sarah putting that together and taking that time. And we will take more time tonight to go through that and read it to people. You can read it yourselves. But I just want you to please look through that because teachers did put a lot of time when we asked for their, what they're working on. Um, only we only had two present tonight, but I'm sure others wanted to, wanted to share their thoughts and, and what they're doing. Great. I want to especially thank Laura and Max for coming out. It's, um, you know, it was, it's an early morning and it's an early morning tomorrow morning and I uh, appreciate both of you being here tonight. Good work. Thank you. Um, we just have reports now. Uh, we'll start off. I have nothing. Um, George, I know you sent out a, uh, a document this afternoon. Do you have anything? I just can I just I I just want to highlight a couple things that I put on my report. Yeah. Uh, um, so once again, so um, one of the things that had come up at the last meeting was there was definitely a concern um, that that Keith had raised also about just the the current um, the situation that was occurring in the um, in the Internet Cafe. Um, so I did want to just touch base on the fact that we that we are we are we are addressing that. Um, so the most straightforward way to address that is through is through staffing. Um, so currently we do have one, we do have one uh, building sub with us uh, on a daily basis that's in a classroom uh, to help out. Um, and we've also got uh, one of our former remote teachers uh, is now back in the building, our Latin teacher, uh, which is also great. And we're also hoping that um, beginning next week, we'll have another uh, building substitute who will be able to actually help cover a classroom uh, so also to hope to start sort of um, funneling off some of the kids uh, that are in the internet cafe. Um, and then just the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, Darius had talked about the pool testing earlier. Um, and I, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm hoping that everybody knows that, that the testing from last week was all of the swabs came back negative and the swabs this week from Monday um, that we've gotten that have come back have also come back negative. So, so that's, we're happy about that. Um, and then um, the student council report had mentioned um, uh, a wellness week. So we're hoping to do like a wellness spirit week, the week of the 15th. Um, one of the things that I don't have on there is our strings teacher, Denise Sittler, actually has recorded. She was able to do a socially distanced um, concert, strings concert with her kids uh, that she recorded it. And she's planning on um, showing it and she's planning on having basically a, a, a concert to, to, to show to, to families and to staff 
uh, on March 15th in the evening. So, so we're really excited about that, which is a good thing. Uh, we're hoping to do, we're planning on doing um, a virtual awards assembly again that week um, and looking at other things uh, as well. Um, so I just wanted to just sort of highlight those things um, uh, from my report. So thanks, Bob. Thanks, George. Anybody have any questions for George? Okay. Uh, Lynn, do you have anything from the collaborative? Um, just that their uh, professional development calendar for semester two has come out. Um, they have professional development for ELLs, uh, books of interest for ELLs, which I thought was really kind of cool. History, mental health, lots of options for professional development. Um, I think, Darius, do you get that? Or George, maybe you do. You get the calendar of professional development. So that's great. So I'd really encourage teachers to take a look at that. Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. And Darius. Uh, just re just reminder we meet we meet again next week for the budget hearing that's the only thing on the agenda next week and then reminder next month is a joint meeting however i believe um we may have to do business after the joint meeting we have to approve spring sports <laughs> so maybe we could we could quickly wrap that up because we have now it requires to have a meeting in april in order to do that so i'm trying to figure out how to kind of we put those kind of things in so we'll probably have a joint meeting which we'll talk about a lot of the the calendars the meeting calendars Professional development calendars. Um, Sarah and Kim will give an overview on, on directions there, and then um, we will have a we will just continue into a frontier meeting afterwards just to handle that. But um, just a reminder: next week we'll see you here for the budget meeting. Are we um, are we with the board of health on Friday? Yes, sorry, and the board of health on Friday will be posted tomorrow. I might, I did talk with it was a lot of back and forth whether or not there was needed to have a meeting. Um, basically because things are going well, but they felt like, you know, we basically should have a basic discussion to set the to set the tone for the season. We're, they're not going to plan on doing weekly meetings unless there's issues. At least that's what I was told. I'll let them make their own decision on that. But um, we were kind of back and forth deciding to figure out how we should do this. Um, and I think that was, it's the cleanest way. So I imagine Friday will be, should be a short meeting. I've said that in the past and been wrong. So the, the topic should be short because of the way things are right now. Thank you. Uh, Keith, did you have something? No, that was my question. Okay. Does anybody else want to share anything with us tonight? If not, I need a motion to adjourn. A motion to adjourn. Raise your hands. Good job, everybody. <laughs>